my presentation will probably be taking a slightly different pace from Eugene's. Um, and rather, I would like to present a, a candid view of my own experiences in contemporary art in Singapore uh, by doing this short presentation for you. Uh, my background is actually in fine art and art history. Uh, I graduated from Goldsmiths several years ago, uh, and I do see myself as an independent art critique. Um, I remember many years ago, there used to be, uh, in the 80s, there used to be uh, publications of art exhibition reviews in the newspapers. But in recent years, uh, at least in the past 10 years or so, those number of um, reviews of art exhibitions has actually decreased. Uh, and so, in 2004 and 2005, as I was talking to my students, it then dawned on me that someone should actually try writing art reviews in Singapore. So I actually started this uh, project, uh, which I continue to today, uh, in which I will try and see an exhibition and try and write an art review. So that project actually will lead me to publish uh, a collection of reviews in September this year, hopefully before the Binale. Um, so with that as a background to what I do besides my day job as an art teacher, uh, I'm just going to present to you what I think is the um, relationship between contemporary art and actually education in schools today. So I, I guess first things first is like uh, like all teachers, uh, usually we try and put some sort of a guiding question to try and steer whoever we are speaking to towards a certain direction. So the question that I pose for myself is, does Singapore actually have a contemporary art scene? And what factors actually influence its growth? Uh, growth? So many people actually might have different um, understanding of some of the terms that I've, I've just thrown up on the screen. Uh, some people say that for any contemporary art scene, you actually need some kind of ecosystem. and, and that term actually appears in the Arts and Culture Strategic Review document published in 2012. Uh, some people say that you know, for any art scene to grow, you actually need some sort of art market. So there needs to be some sort of economics, money driving force, government pumping money, and so on. Uh, there needs to be some kind of social factor. Uh, people must actually want to see visual arts. Uh, cultural factors as well. There must be uh, people who are just cultured enough to actually want to see it. History, do we actually have a history? Um, and as Eugene has pointed out, a lot of Singapore art history is actually probably still in archive and not really written or talked about as much as we in schools teachers would like to. And of course, everyone says that education is the medicine to all the problems in the world. Uh, so how does actually education play a role in growing the contemporary art scene? So these are actually some highlights from the population survey on the arts. Uh, NAC actually do quant quantitative surveys, and these are some of the highlights that I put up. Uh, this document, if you just Google using the exact same title, you can actually find the document. It's, it's freely available from NAC's website. So what we found, or what I found from that survey, uh, actually tells us that visual arts is actually growing in importance uh, because more people are attending it, uh, more people see value in it, uh, and of course, more importantly, it's actually evenly distributed across demographics and income groups. Because a lot of people think that visual arts or arts in general is actually very elitist, so that's not necessarily true. Uh, and of course, more people do see that the arts have some kind of personal benefits. Uh, and of course, that definition of personal benefits will differ from individual to, to the next. And what's also interesting is, uh, from a similar research, this one's a lot smaller, the previous one, I think the uh, sample size was from well, the people who did the survey was about 2,038. For this particular study, about 80 people were interviewed and the results were codified. And from there, what's interesting is the, uh, the researcher actually suggested um, several key factors that determine whether or not an individual continues to participate in arts event after they leave school, after they leave MOE system and after they leave uh, tertiary universities and so on. So among all these factors, uh, of course at the heart of it is actually some kind of self-motivation and drive, passion and self-expression, which most of us will not deny. Uh, but of course surrounding that, which points to this concept of ecosystem, uh, is you know, did this individual have sufficient exposure to the arts at school, which I'll come back to again, social bonds, uh, does this group belong to any community that encourages arts. For example, if you belong to a family of uh, uh, music music lovers, chances are you would actually go to a music concert with your family. Um, levels of fun, 
oops, wrong spelling. Maybe there's a Freudian mistake. Uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be how much you enjoy it, uh, not, not how much money you earn from it. Uh, commitment to do it. Um, uh, this one is a bit interesting. Uh, the research actually explained it as like how much fun you derive from the activity and how much commitment you need to participate in it. So for example, if you were to say that you to, to really enjoy the arts, you need to participate as a volunteer, then maybe not everyone is ready to commit that level of time, amount of time to that activity. Info and comms, not everyone might receive uh, information about the arts. So from what I've been hearing, the Arts and Cultural Strategic Review, they're coming up with this new Arts and Cultural Portal that's supposed to aggregate all the arts and cultural activities in Singapore. And I think they are trying to launch it at the end of the year. So from there, maybe that can reach out to more people. Uh, new commitments. Uh, maybe we will see, you know, when they uh, after finishing school, they got work, they get married, you know, then maybe arts fall a lot less on their priority lists. Um, and lastly, supportive social milieu refers to how does society value it? Um, how 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 do people see social capital and its relationship to the arts, or arts and the relationship to social capital? So I would like to just elaborate a bit more on the exposure to the arts and how how that actually. Would, uh, would actually link to the conference because at the conference you will see diverse interests and diverse um, research interests and of course passion from educators in the arts, music, dance and drama. So just coming back to the visual arts, this actually kind of shows the Singapore education landscape. This slide I guess is important because uh, we don't really show it on the ministry's website because it's kind of something that is often taken for granted. Uh, but actually, general art is actually compulsory in primary and all the way up to lower secondary schools. So some parents, I mean, from the ministry, we often hear teachers complaining to us that parents tell them that why is art compulsory? Can my can my son not do art? Why must he do art? You know. So parents are actually one of the uh, uh, causes of tension that teachers have in schools. I'll come back to tension to that one. But what this slide is trying to show us is actually essentially there are multiple pathways in our education system and specific to the arts, there's actually a lot of avenues in which a student can pursue arts, uh, either in tertiary, uh, as, as an academic subject and even something just for passion like in CCS and so on. So this, this is something that I, I want us to kind of recall, which is the visual arts actually foster, or, or at least what we at the ministry think, and of course educators around the world, that the visual arts foster creative and imaginative ways of thinking. And uh, actually we hope students will develop aesthetic and cultural awareness from which personal and cultural identities could be examined and built upon. So there's a lot of self-reflection that uh, visual arts can actually build an individual. So just to illustrate what uh, the visual arts look like in our schools, I picked out, uh, this is why I have my heart this, uh, so bear with me. It's actually not a very good sample, but it's taken from the Singapore Youth Festival 2010 exhibition. Uh, this one is 09 and subsequently will be from 2010. So these are actually some of the works that primary school kids make in schools today. It's actually no longer just potato print or fingerprinting. <laughs> or making dinosaurs out of play doh only. It's actually a lot more complex, sophisticated, uh, and it actually is quite culturally diverse, and of course, across different mediums. In secondary schools as well, uh, paper cut, printmaking, paper cut on the bottom left, uh, and I think this is kind of a, a craft form that has been relegated to CCAs, but again, I think it's still alive in some schools, seal carving, and top right-hand corner, digital, uh, digital painting and of course in junior colleges ceramics and even a kinetic sculpture mixed media installation so art in our schools are no longer seen as something that's very boring but it's actually quite exciting uh, but of course oops reserve battery level <laughs> Okay, good. Um, yeah, so, so coming back to this, so what are some of the challenges that teachers may have? Uh, rather than seeing these as challenges or problems, I think some academics would prefer to see them as creative tensions. Creative tensions, if, you, if you've been reading into concepts of uh, learning organizations or creativity, creative tensions basically suggest that, you know, if you can turn every single problem into a, a solution, it will actually strengthen that 
that particular concept or particular solution. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of them. Uh, I guess in, in uh, contemporary literature about art education, there's this concept called visual literacy, which a lot of people think uh, is where the value of the arts uh, lie in. And at the background to that simple concept is actually this dominance of uh, literary language and written modes of expression. Why do I say that? Imagine if I don't put words on the slides and just the picture, would it sufficiently tell what I would like to convey? Probably not. And me putting words on it probably just reinforce that. Uh, and of course, language written words has a specific use and a specific purpose. Secondly, uh, in schools, the, the background of children are very diverse. Uh, in some schools, we have, um, um, okay, I'm not speaking the schools, but uh, this, there are some schools that have actually up to 30% uh, non-Singaporeans. So the students don't even speak English. So imagine trying to teach any subject, let alone art, it's actually quite challenging. And we also have children who come from backgrounds where their parents tell them art is useless. So imagine trying to tell the kid to bring art materials to come. When the parents say art is useless, you don't need to bring anything to school. Just go like that. The teacher will provide everything. So in a climate like that, uh, what can the art teacher do? So that's one. Oops. Creative passion. Yeah. <laughs> my backup plan is to talk from my phone. Anyway, that is very near the last slide. So uh, if you allow me to talk, talk you through it. Uh, what else was on my slide is actually this pre-concept of art and art teaching. Uh, and the next point is uninhabited personal expression versus meaningful response. I guess the biggest challenge is a lot of people still believe that art should only be for personal expression. In other words, uh, don't, don't bother me with what I want to express because I say what I want to say. Don't bother about making nice art because it's self-expression is more important uh, versus you know, art must communicate an idea. The recipient's interpretation is just as important as the maker's interpretation. Uh, and some people actually say that art has therapeutic effects. And as a result, right, therapeutic effects is more important than how the picture or how the artwork looks. That means over aesthetics, which isn't necessarily true. Uh, and of course, that is vis-a-vis uh, -vis this concept of cognitive, psychomotor, affective and social um, effects that art possibly can have. Uh, and the other creative potential would be schools, time and space because that, well, according to MOE planning norms, there are actually only a uh, certain number of weeks in a year. So all of us who've been through school will know that or have kids will know there are only like X number of weeks in a year. So actually for planning purposes, schools are told that they only need to plan up to 29 weeks in a year. So imagine that your child or your relative, someone you know, or teachers amongst you, uh, you will probably agree with me that 29 hours of art a year is a big challenge because you can't teach everything, but neither can you teach nothing. And if if every teacher tries to cram everything in, then you end up diluting uh, certain learning outcomes. So that, that's one of the creative tensions that teachers face. Uh, and next is actually uh, this challenge. Uh, when, when As teachers, a lot of people don't quite understand, but as a teacher, you are really nurturing the whole child. You're not simply teaching a subject. If you're teaching a subject, maybe you're a tuition teacher. Yeah. Uh, but actually, as, as a teacher in school, it's really about the whole child. So sometimes when you are when you have this student in your class it's, and that person has other issues, it's important that the teacher tries to tackle that issue first before, before learning that subject. So all these things will actually, not say get in the way, but will be things that the teacher will be concerned about uh, and will try to resolve together with school support and parents for the child in order for the child to progress in life. Uh, and of course, the other creative tension is this idea of pedagogy for 21st century learners. This whole idea of 21st century is really big on everyone, uh, most of the educators' minds today. How different is 21st century teaching from uh, teaching that's just uh, 13 years ago? You know, has it really changed that much? Okay, uh, and coming back to this idea of ecosystem, I, I think one of the things that 
teachers should consider is to give both themselves time, give their students time, uh, and for us, the audience here today, is to actually believe that everyone has a role to play in our education. Uh, and in one of the essays that I wrote for my book, uh, I actually have this uh, chapter titled Singapore Arts. Singapore visual arts need to you. So I'm just going to read some of the seven points that, you know, Singapore like to read everything in point form, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to read to you what, what, what I put. How anyone uh, in Singapore can actually support the visual arts. And in, in that essay, I actually said that it's not always important to give money because people think money can solve everything. That's, that's not necessarily true. Um, number one, uh, to support the visual arts, you should visit an art exhibition at least once a month. Because imagine if everyone in Singapore visits art exhibitions once a month, I think the uh, viewership will be way, way bigger. And once a month isn't that difficult. So you can do it after this talk, you can go down to Jandela Gallery, or you can spend five minutes looking at that wonderful uh, installation in the concourse, or you can, on your way to the MRT station, you can drop by the Linkway, the tunnel, just to look at artworks. Uh, secondly, you can follow the work of an artist that you like, because I think in art and in schools as well, we tell students that it's not say we tell them. We, we hope students will understand that actually it is important that they have their own voice, their own opinions are heard, and they, they can actually follow an artist that they like. Thirdly, uh, I think as audience here, we can actually show interest in the school's art program and children's art. So sometimes, you know, rather than going to school and ask, so how is the school's academic result? How is this and how is that? Maybe you can ask about what is the art program like? Because that would give, you know, whoever's whoever you're speaking to some idea that actually the person, you as a person actually value the arts. Fourthly, uh, I would encourage everyone to see graduation art exhibitions and this actually includes uh, graduates from NAFA, LaSalle, uh, NIE, uh, ADM, just to name a few. Um, fifthly, you can read, discuss and form your own opinions for art. Six, learn new skills or further your existing art or craft related skills. And seven, you can actually volunteer your, volunteer your time for an arts related course. So that again, uh, actually, there are actually websites that send that are set up to actually aggregate all the demands, and uh, you can probably find it on social networks as well. So with that, I come to the end of my uh, presentation. Any questions from the floor? Yes. Uh, where can we see your your art reviews? Um, if you if you go on to any search engine, if you type Boone's Cafe, or if you type Singapore Art, it should be on the first page. Oh, Whoa. First page. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, just type Boone's Cafe, yeah. Oh, okay. that, that should come up. Yes? Do you think we need a foundation in the history of art, or classical art, to appreciate contemporary art more? Okay, the question is, do we need a foundation? Uh, I'm, I guess you're referring to a course, a particular module in university or something. Sure. Or in general? Like in general, like materials, Okay. Okay. So the question was, do we need a foundation, institution, organization, or some kind of support in classical traditional art in order for us to appreciate contemporary art? Um, based on based on my opinion, the answer is probably no, because as long as you you can read, you can write a little bit, uh, you can respond to things, uh, you would be able to respond to contemporary art. Uh, and I'm saying this based on uh, our recent interaction with uh, Professor Terry Barrett, who's actually a, an art critique, uh, and he's written many books on interpreting art and so on. And he has this uh, set of principles which he thinks are actually universal, and he thinks that one of the key principles is anyone can interpret art. And in any interpretation of art, it doesn't necessarily need to match the artist's intention. So just based on these two principles, it's, it's possible that you don't actually need prior knowledge. Because for instance, you can just look at that Shakespeare image, for instance. You can actually appreciate the visual qualities of this line. Uh, I can probably guess that it's made from a, a woodcut. Um, and it's, it's probably taken from a certain period, or maybe a, a reproduction of a certain period. And you can talk about it from a very uh, formal, analytical, formal qualities perspective, or you can talk about um, how it then relates to you. You can talk about its costume, you can talk about its hairstyle, uh, you can talk about many, many things about the image. And when you relate yourself to that image, you're actually responding to the artwork. So in that sense, you don't necessarily need 
um, classical or traditional uh, history to be able to appreciate it. But having said that, I think it's important that at some point in the nation's development, there need to be people, uh, an institution, organization, that would actually be writing about Singapore art history. Because without which, uh, you're just floating around. There's no anchor. Yeah. Thank you. There's a very little uh, production of, of critic, art critic, and also um, scholar um, uh, material on, on contemporary art in Singapore. How do you think that this can change? What has to be done for people to get more work done on, on, on contemporary art? I think if you talk about scholarly work, there are different avenues. Uh, there, there's actually an... Um, I need to remember the abbreviation. It's called ICA, but it's something like... Um, okay, Wayne Choi is going to kill me. Um, sorry? Uh, okay, it's basically this, this association. Association? Okay, how does it go? International... Okay. International Critics Association. There's actually a uh, there's actually one in Singapore, and it's made up loosely of a group of uh, academics based in Singapore. They are not necessarily all Singaporeans, but they they actually write about contemporary art. And most of the writing that you will find on contemporary visual arts in Singapore are actually not published locally. So you'll find it in journals in like say Art Asia Pacific, which is uh, which is strangely now based in the states. Uh, and you can find it in a lot of the, the journals, uh, even art text. Sometimes it publishes Singapore writing on Singapore performance art and so on. So th there's actually a, a, an undercurrent, and a, of course, a lot of people actually publish on social media. So you get a lot of young writers, they actually publish their own writings on the blogs, but just not on Straits Times, uh, yeah, for various reasons. Yeah. <coughs> okay, I think it's fair to say that we can, if you've got any personal questions, I'll be staying a bit longer. If not, I will pass the mic to uh, Chien. Uh, 